Thank you. You may be seated. Um, it is good to be back home at Freedom Church. And um, super excited about being here. Flew in on um, Thursday. I don't even know what day I got here. Um, but it all kind of runs together. And super excited about being here with you today. And, and super excited about tonight. Let me just kind of... Stop and say, if, if you're going to text somebody in the message today, make sure it's to invite them tonight. You have permission to say, I'm where you're going to be tonight, and you need to bring them here because I believe that we're going to see salvation in this house tonight. How many's with me on that? How many, is, how many people have invited at least one person? Okay. Invite them, and when they tell you no, listen, here's the thing I've, I've told people for years. Don't invite them. Bring them. Just show up at their house and say you have no choice and take a bunch of your friends with you so you can drag them along if you need to. Hey, if you have a Bible today, I want you to go to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 14. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 14, and I just want to talk to you for a few minutes today on the greatness of God, on the greatness of God. Now, I am horrible at remembering people's names. I'm, I'm awful. Anybody with me, you just can't remember names? Yeah, now I can remember numbers. I can remember numbers, but I can't, I'm kind of like Rain Man. I can't remember names. But years and years and years ago, and this is a slight miracle, I, um, I was flying on an airplane, and right before I was getting ready to get on this airplane, it was a really cool story, because a friend of mine had a private jet. Um, and yeah, if you're going to have a friend, find one that has a private jet. Um, and so I didn't have a private jet, but my friend have a, had a private jet. And he was like, hey, I'm going to let you use my private jet. And I was like, this is obviously God at work. Um, and so, he, so I showed up at the um, airfield, and it was a blue sky. It was beautiful. It was absolutely amazing. And I walked up to the pilot, and the pilot's name is Travis. Now, that's a miracle. I don't remember people's names at all. But I'm going to tell you why I remember Travis's name. Travis, I walked up to him, and he's got a chart in one hand, and he's got his iPad in the other, and he's looking at the iPad, and he's looking at the chart, and he's looking at the iPad, and he's looking at the chart, and he looked at me, and he said, doesn't look good. I said, well, let's not go then. I mean, it just settles it right now. He said, no, 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 no. He said, it doesn't look good. He said, there's a storm coming, and it's a bad one. But I think we'll be okay. <laughs> well, I'm like, I need you to do a little bit more than think, bruh. I need, I need to know, Travis. He goes, no, 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 no. He said, I've done this before. And he's looking at the iPad and he's looking at the chart and he said, I think we're going to be okay. Um, here's what you need to know. I'm going to land this plane. I was like, okay, well, that's awesome, Travis. And I got... In the, but I had this thought, eventually they all land. Um, one way or the other, they all land, so I wasn't very comforted. So I got in the plane, and I looked at my friend who was with me, and I was like, I think he's, I think he's trying to pull a joke, because there wasn't a cloud in the sky. It was beautiful. I said, I think he's just trying to freak us out. I just think he's trying to scare us. I just think he's trying to get us to use the bathroom on the plane, That's because there was no bathroom. And so I think, I think that's what, so we took off, and the takeoff was smooth, and it was blue sky, and it was just gorgeous, and I'm just kind of digging this plane ride. It's just absolutely amazing. I looked at my friend, and I said, that guy doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> Until I began to notice the sky getting a little gray, and then we began to experience this thing called Turbulence. Have you ever been on a plane with turbulence? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's when everybody starts hitting the little button, ding, ding, because they all want to drink, right? Um, there was no stewardess on this plane. There's no flight attendant on this plane. And then I started seeing lightning out the window. When you see lightning out the window, you're like, amen, come Lord Jesus, I'm getting ready to leave. And the plane starts shaking all over. And I'm shaking, and the guy next to me is shaking, and we might have said a swear word or two, but God's forgiven me. We sang about it. It's nailed to the cross. Amen. I mean, but I was freaked out. And as we're descending rapidly, I might ask, or I might add, it's just a little bit too, 
Travis turns back and looks at me and goes, I got this. I'm like, dear God, I hope so, Travis, because it, I don't. And so, so we're shaking the plane. And finally, we came out of the storm and landed on the runway just beautifully. And Travis got out of the cockpit and walked back, and he looked at me, and he said, I told you I'd land this plane. I said, Travis, you're my favorite person in the world. But it just, it just reminded me that I've never forgotten that experience. And I've never forgotten Travis's name. And the reason I haven't forgotten that experience and the reason I haven't forgotten Travis's name is because all of us, that's my airplane story, but for some of us, that's our life story. Like there was a time in your life where things were going really good, where, where the takeoff was really good and there were no clouds in the sky. But all of a sudden, things began to get gray. And you begin to experience maybe a storm in your life. Maybe you, you didn't experience a storm in your past. Maybe there's somebody here that's going through a storm today. Maybe it's a relational storm. Maybe it's an emotional storm. Maybe it's a financial storm. The thing I know about everybody in this room is that we're either A, in a storm, B, coming out of a storm, or C, getting ready to go in a storm. But the thing that I've learned just in my life and the thing that I've learned in studying Scripture is this, that storms are a stage where we can see Christ more clearly. Sometimes it takes a storm for us to realize how great he really is. And sometimes in the good times we can celebrate who he is, but it takes the bad times for us to be able to see who he is. And with that in mind, I want to go to the story today because Matthew chapter 14, there's two stories back to back that we're going to talk, talk about. It won't take long. We'll just be here a couple hours, um, and I'm going to work through this text together. Here we go. That was a joke. I'll get you out of here sooner than that. Now, let me kind of set this up. Jesus and his disciples had just heard that John the Baptist had been killed. John the Baptist was Jesus' cousin, it had his head cut off, bad day. Um, and, and Jesus and the disciples had just learned about this. And the Bible says this. When Jesus, in verse 13, when Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Now I wanna pause. How many of you, just at some point in your life, You've just needed some time away. Anybody in the room, you just needed, like all the moms have two hands up, right? <laughs> moms, moms, just be honest. How many of you have locked yourself in the bathroom for 10 minutes? You're just like, because you're tired of hearing, mommy, 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 and you're in the bathroom and you're just like, dear God, dear God, I just need 10 minutes. I just 10 minutes. And all of a sudden you see that little hand come under the door. Mommy, what are you doing there? Mommy, what are you doing there? I'm building a rocket. Get out of here. Like that's, I nailed it, right? I nailed it. Dad's like, what are you talking about? You're out on the tractor. You have no idea what women go through. Well, I'm preaching now, right? But there are times we need time away. And Jesus, one of the things that I think I've lost sight of many times is he was fully God, but he was fully man. And he experienced sorrow just like we experience sorrow. And so he heard that John the Baptist, his cousin, had been killed, and he knew he was next. So he wanted to get away. The Bible says he went away to a solitary place. But the, but the Bible goes on to say this. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. Like they're chasing after him. It's like a rock star. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, this blows my mind, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. See, if that was written about me, it would say when Perry landed and saw the crowd, he went off on them. I mean, I would have been like, do you people not have a life? Go home. But the Bible says, and I love this, that Jesus had compassion 
on these people. Now, I want to pause before, before I go any further, and I want you to know that if you're here today, I don't know how you've been treated in the past by people, by people that say they know God, but what I know about God is this. He sees you here today, and he has compassion on you. He knows your story. He knows where you are. He knows what you've gone through, and while other people may heap condemnation on you, the Bible says, that in Christ there is no condemnation and while the world may heap condemnation Jesus sees us with compassion aren't you glad that Jesus sees us with compassion the Bible says he had compassion on them and healed their sick that's awesome so so it's one of those things where they they're hanging out with Jesus and this is kind of early in the day and the Bible says in verse 15 As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place, and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Now, I can just imagine this. Like, the apostles are kind of hanging out, and they're with Jesus, and Jesus is teaching, and he's teaching, and he's teaching, and he's teaching, and they're looking at each other going, is he, go- is he gonna stop? And Thomas is like, I doubt it. <laughs> Bible humor, Bible humor. And um, like, what, what, are, what are we gonna do? And he's teaching, I don't know. And they're like, well, let's tell him, let's tell him we're concerned about the people. Because if we tell him, because we're getting hungry, But if we tell him we're hungry, he won't care. But if we tell him the people are hungry, then maybe he'll let them go. So Peter, maybe it's Peter. I don't know. It's probably Peter. Peter walks up to him and goes, hey, listen, um, uh, um, we've really enjoyed this entire series of messages you've just preached (laughs) for the past 11 hours. This has been amazing. Um, But we were thinking that the food trucks didn't show up. And because we don't have any food trucks, um, the people are hungry. And it, we, we could listen to this all day because we love it, except for Thomas. Um, but, but we have this concern for the people. And watch what Jesus does. Because Jesus, Jesus is always flipping the switch on the disciples, right? I love this. Jesus replied, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. Peter was like, hold on. I think he's smoking crack. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not sure. But he told us to give them something to eat. Now, now here, here's, what, here's where it gets crazier. Um, verse 17, we have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. So the fish and chips, right? The fish and chips thing right here in the scripture. I'm making it in English. Um, we have here only, and we know from other stories in the Bible, they didn't have it. They beat up a little boy and took his lunch, right? Little boy had gone to McDonald's, got a Happy Meal. They took his Happy Meal. They said, sit right there, kid. Jesus needs this. They said, all we've got is five loaves and two fish. This is it. This is all we've God, this won't feed that many. There's 5,000 people. There's 5,000 men plus women and children. So we have a little, and there's a lot. And our little won't feed a lot. That's what they're thinking. (laughs) But this is Jesus. And Jesus never does what we expect him to do. Right? And so so Jesus says, um, bring them here to me. In other words, I see what you've got. Put it in my hands. Take what you've got and put it in my hands. And that's what we've been talking about for the past several weeks. Take what we've got and putting it in the hands of Jesus. Because in our hands, we've got five loaves and two fishes. But in the hands of Jesus, he has a buffet that can feed thousands. And I love how this plays out. I love this miracle, basically because it has food involved. 
Bring them here to me, he said, and he directed the people to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and two fish, he looked up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. This is the first buffet in scripture, I love it. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men besides the women and children. Now here's what I love about this story. The little boy had five loaves and two fish and he gave it all to Jesus. He didn't give him three loaves and one fish or one loaf and a half a fish. He said, this is all I've got. But I think you are greater than me and because your greatness is better than my greatness, I'm just gonna put what I've got in your hands. And the Bible says there's a couple things. First of all, the disciples took up how many basketfuls? 12. You think the little boy got his food back? I don't think he walked away from this hungry. But the reason I see this particular story standing out so well is because this is what I've seen right here in the life of this church. There are campuses all over the world meeting today because somebody in Hereford decided, I'm going to bring five loaves and two fish because I want there to be a campus in Cardiff. Somebody in Hereford said, I'm gonna bring five loaves and two fish because I want there to be a campus in Chennai, in Kampala, in Cambodia, in South Africa, in Mombasa, in Rwanda, and people in this church for years have brought their loaves and fishes and placed them in the hands of Jesus. And had we held on to them, they would have not accomplished anything. But because you, have chosen to be generous with what Jesus has placed in your hands and you've trusted him with it. We are seeing salvation all over the globe every single week because people take what they've got and they just put it in the hands of Jesus. So in this series, when we're talking about giving, I know what some of you are thinking, my little bit won't make a difference. And I would say to you, I'm really glad that this boy in the story didn't think my five loaves and two fishes can't make a difference. Because when we put it in the hands of Jesus, it just goes further. But that's not the miracle. It's not the miracle. It's crazy. if, If you keep on reading... In fact, let me just say this. After this miracle, this particular miracle, they would have said, Jesus is, he's great. He's a provider. He's a miracle worker. But there's a problem. There's a serious problem. Verse 22 says this. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. Now, for years, that verse confused me because Jesus had so much popularity at this point. But see, the goal wasn't necessarily to, to feed the crowd. It was for the disciples to understand who he is. Because in order for the disciples to understand, uh, in order for the disciples to fulfill their mission, which was to take the gospel to the world, they had to see Jesus as more than a miracle worker and more than a food provider and more than a good person that does good deeds. And the miracle of the fish and loaves, while it was so amazing, did not quite reveal who he was. And so he had to remove them from the situation because let me stop real quick. The disciples were more than likely tempted to think they were awesome. Because who did Jesus distribute the food through? The disciples. And so they weren't Jesus, but they were with Jesus. 
And so there, there could have been some pride. There could have been some arrogance. I mean, they were taking selfies of themselves, right, and posting them on Instagram. Like, we, we are awesome. And people were like, hey, you're not Jesus, but you're the guy with Jesus, and we love you. So Jesus loved them enough to remove them from a tempting situation. And let me pause and say, that's the reason that some of you broke up with your boyfriend. It wasn't because God's punishing you, it's because he's preparing you for what's next and he removed you from that relationship. He removed you from that job. He removed you from that situation. He removed you from those things, not because he's mad at you, but because he has compassion on you and has greater plans for your life. So he made him get in the boat, and, and he said, just go to the other side. Now, this is not a trick question. Did Jesus know the storm was coming, yes or no? Yes. See, television preachers have the ability to make me angrier than anybody on the planet. I don't know if you guys have really bad televangelists over here in the UK, but you'll see people on television in America say, oh, if you just trust Jesus, <laughs> if you just follow the Lord, nothing bad will ever happen to you. I'm like, well, what about Jesus? Because if I've he went to the place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. And he told me to take up my cross, not my mattress. Here's what I'm learning right now. There's always a purpose in the storm. And it's not to punish us. It's to prepare us to see Christ more clearly than we've ever seen him in our lives. He knew the storm was coming. So they're out in the boat. The Bible says, they're out in the boat, verse 23. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Can't you see the disciples? They're out there mad. He knew this was going to happen, son of God. He knows this stuff. We were out there with a the crowd. We were getting our picture taken. I was signing autographs. He made us get in the boat. Now we're out here, and in the middle of this storm, and it stinks. Have you ever been mad at God? Yeah, yeah. I had like one honest person. Everybody's like, no, I love the Lord with all my heart. <laughs> there have been so many times that me, I'm a pastor, I'm a preacher, I work for God for a living, right? That you look up at God and go, are you kidding me? Are you, are you kidding me right now? Are you, like whenever I sit next to a chatty person on an airplane, I'm like, are you gotta be kidding me? You got to be kidding me. So then I'll fake like I'm going to sleep. And if that don't work, I'll fake like I'm getting sick and they'll leave me alone. I, I do what I can. But in this story, they're in the middle of the storm. And so they, they went from being the center of attention to the center of a storm. They went from a spiritual high to a spiritual low. And every one of us in this room have had that experience. There are days when we feel like we can move mountains. And then there are days we feel like we're being crushed by one. But in either instance... We serve a great God who is going to use that circumstance to reveal himself in ways we've never seen. I'll prove it to you. This is great. I love the Bible. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake, which, by the way, is awesome. I don't know if you ever tried this, but it's impossible. <laughs> I met a nut one time that said, I think I can walk on water. I was like, I bet you $100 that you can't. I have faith. I'm like, I'm about to have your money. Let's go. Let's go to the lake right now. <laughs> Idiot. I said that in my heart, not out loud. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, 
They were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. Now, two things I want to say before I move on. Number one, don't judge the disciples. Don't judge them. See, we read this and we're like, I can't believe they didn't recognize Jesus. If you were in a boat in the middle of a lake, in the middle of a storm, and you see somebody walking towards you, none of you are going to go, hold on. We are in the presence of Jesus. It is okay. No, see, they hadn't read the book of Matthew yet, so they didn't know how the story was going to turn out. So they saw Jesus, and they said he was a ghost. They did not recognize him. And when we do not recognize Jesus, we're bound to stay in the storms that we're in. So they don't, they don't recognize him. They say, it's a ghost. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Don't miss this. If you're in the middle of a storm today, all you've got to do is look around. Because he's coming to you. I don't know where you are in your walk with God, but I know exactly where he is in his walk with you. He's closer than you think. He is closer than you know. And he says, I see the storm that you're in, but do not be afraid. Now, I love Peter's reaction because Jesus had just said, it is me. And then Peter says, don't you love Peter? Lord, if it's you, and Jesus is like, I, I just... I just, I just said it was me. I mean, for the love. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. So Peter's a bit skeptical, as we all would have been in this situation. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat and walked toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind... He was afraid and began to, beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, I love this. I love immediately. I love immediately. Like as soon as Peter cried out, Jesus didn't say, I don't know. I don't know, man. I got that whole denial thing coming up. I know about that. I've read the end of the book. We're just going to kind of let you sink. We're going to let you bob a little bit. Bob up and down a little bit. <laughs> See how that goes. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? Now, I want to just say this, and this is an aside. When he said, you have little faith, why did you doubt? I don't think he was talking to Peter. I think he turned and he talked to the other 11 disciples because Peter's the only one that had the guts to get out of the boat to begin with. We've always thought he was talking to Peter. What if he wasn't talking to Peter at all? What if he was talking to the people that didn't even have the courage to think he was great enough to sustain him in the middle of an impossible situation? See, Peter saw the greatness of God. And when we see the greatness, let me tell you something. When we see the greatness of God, giving's not an issue. It's not. In fact, this is my challenge. I challenge people with this all the time. If he's not great, don't give. If he's not great, don't give. But see, I'm under the impression that he's great because he reminds me of it. I went running this morning, running, just went out running, and I watched the sun rise, and it just, it looked like the cloud was, the clouds were just, they were cotton candy pink, and it was orange and it was beautiful and it's like God got up with his paintbrush this morning and said I'm going to paint something really awesome I'd like to think it was for me but probably wasn't for me it's probably like for the world um, but it, he painted it and I was like oh he is so great every time I hold a baby I think about the greatness of God do you know the odds of you being born were one in 400 trillion yeah yeah think about it if your mom would have had one more glass of wine, you wouldn't be here. <laughs> or in some cases, because your mom had one more glass of wine, <laughs> you're here. I don't know how that worked out. 
Different message, different time, all right? Now, this is the key. This is the key. This is the key right here. This is the key to message. After the miracle of the fish and chips, they would have called him good provider, miracle worker, but they didn't truly recognize who he was. But after the storm, after they went through the struggle, after they had fought all night, after they had seen him show up in a way they had never seen him before, after they had seen one of their own attempt and accomplish the impossible, and they get rescued when he fell, and after they got back in the boat, don't miss this, don't miss this, don't miss this, and when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down, then those who were in the boat worshiped him saying, truly you are the son of God. They didn't recognize him after the loaves and fishes. They recognized him after the storm. I've probably easily been on over 250 to 300 different air, airplane flights in the past five years. I can only tell you one pilot's name. His name's Travis. And the reason I can tell you Travis's name is because he landed the plane in the middle of a storm. And I think Travis is a great, I went on later on to find out that Travis is one of the only pilots in the history of the world that has survived a mid-air collision between an airplane and a helicopter. He's got quite a resume. And if I ever had to fly on a plane through a storm, I would want Travis because Travis landed the plane. But while Travis is great, let's talk about Jesus because he's got quite an extensive resume. And we can talk about his miracles, but the one that gets me is is they crucified him and they put him in a tomb. And three days later, he, see, he knows something about storms because he went through a storm, but he came out on the other side greater because when they killed him, they said, he is a man. But when he rose from the grave, they said, truly, you are the son of God. And if you're in the middle of a storm today, I would simply challenge you to begin looking around because Jesus is about to reveal himself in a way that you've never seen him before. The storms are a stage where Jesus reveals himself more clearly than we've ever seen him. How great, how great is the God we serve. How great has he been to you personally? Now, there may be some people here today, and, and I understand if you're like this, well, he hasn't been great to me at all, that the very air you're breathing right now is a gift. How great has he been to you? What has he done for you? And because, listen, going back, if he's not great, then let's not give him anything. But if he is great, let's offer him everything. Amen.